Season 1 of Amazon's Lord of the Rings The Rings of Power is drawing to a close. And in the face of negative reviews, a hostile fanbase and by all objective metrics extremely lackluster viewing figures. The powers that be must have decided that it was high time to put a spin on the situation and establish the official industry narrative. Which is why we have paid for puff pieces as cover stories in both The Hollywood Reporter and Variety. One focused on the Rings of Power showrunners Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne, the other focused on Jennifer Salke, Amazon's answer to Lucasfilm's Kathleen Kennedy. Between these two puff pieces, there is a lot to unpack here, so it will take a few videos to get through it all and sort reality from the spin and the misdirects. But let's begin at the beginning, namely with the showrunners and how they got the job of helming the most expensive series ever made despite having zero prior credits on anything that actually ended up getting made. In this editorial then, I'll go through the spin and break down the truth on the motivation behind the series, the showrunner's qualifications, and how they got the job. This comes from the October 5th Hollywood Reporter piece titled The Rings of Power Showrunners Break Silence on Backlash, Sauron and Season 2. And it's a big piece, with the byline, Two first-time showrunners who landed TV's biggest series give The Hollywood Reporter a behind-the-scenes tour as they navigate challenges even scarier than Mordor, from patently evil online trolling to massive industry expectations. Remember, while industry outlets like The Hollywood Reporter, Variety and others of that ilk on occasion will do some actual exposés and investigative journalism the studios would rather they did not, they exist in symbiosis with the studios and oftentimes act like studio mouthpieces, and this is one such time. So, let's see what narrative they want to put out there, and if we can't cut through that and see what actually lies behind. The large, windowless room's centerpiece is a lengthy conference table, but your eyes are immediately transfixed by what's covering the walls. You're surrounded by concept art laying out major set pieces for The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Season 2. Showrunners McKay and J.D. Payne give a walkthrough of the sequences. They plan to introduce more iconic locations, familiar Middle-earth characters, and a massive two-episode battle. This is, obviously, top-secret stuff. No media has been allowed on the fantasy drama set, let alone this room. But the showrunners wanted to give the world a peek behind the curtain to reveal what it's like to manage the biggest TV series ever produced. Now see, that was all spin. Amazon wants to set the narrative, by way of The Hollywood Reporter, that the showrunners have graciously granted you an exclusive peek into their war room. To preview the awesomeness to come. Now, you'll have a head start compared to all your friends and colleagues around the water cooler. Are you not grateful, Peon? Now, if we cut through that spin, what we're actually seeing here is that Amazon are freaked out that season one of their billion dollar investment is an absolute dud. They are not getting anywhere near the numbers they need, and so they need to get the word out there that things will get much better and much more familiar in season two. They need you to know that right now, before you tune out permanently, and so they're counting on the narrative put forth in this piece to be further disseminated by the rest of their friends in the entertainment media complex. That is what is going on here, and that is what this piece is all about. Now that we know that, let's go back to the very beginning and compare the narrative and truth about how this all happened in the first place. Before going through how all this came together, The Hollywood Reporter let the showrunners address the criticism which hurts them the most. Some of what's been the hardest to hear is the cynical point of view that this is a cash grab, McKay says. It's like, oh my god, the opposite. This is the most earnest production. This is not a paycheck job for anybody. This is a labor of love. Okay, keep that in mind. On how all this came together, The Hollywood Reporter writes, the call from the lawyers came into Amazon on a Friday in 2017. The Tolkien estate was going to entertain proposals for a Lord of the Rings show. Okay, let's hold it right there. 
This all started in 2017. That is significant, and since The Hollywood Reporter isn't doing any actual journalism here, they conveniently skipped right over why. So allow me. 2017 is the year when Christopher Tolkien, the son of THE Tolkien, head of the Tolkien estate and preserver of the Tolkien legacy, retired at age 93. The rest of the Tolkien heirs, who took over the running of the estate, were more like, enough with this preserving the legacy bullshit, let's get paid. The industry knew this full well, which is why Slash Film at the time ran the piece, Christopher Tolkien resigns from the Tolkien estate. Does this mean more Lord of the Rings movies and shows? The answer to that, of course, was a resounding yes. Not to further disseminate the Tolkien legacy, but to monetize it and get paid, now that Christopher Tolkien was no longer there to gatekeep. This is something Amazon doesn't want you to know or certainly to think too much about, and it does shine a new light on that quote. Some of what's been hardest to hear is the cynical point of view that this is a cash grab. It's like, oh my god, the opposite. This is the most earnest production. This is not a paycheck job for anybody. This is a labor of love. What he's saying here is Hollywood speak for that this is very much so a cash grab for everyone involved. We're not just doing this for money. We're doing it for a shitload of money. With that, let's move on to how Payne and McKay got the job. The Hollywood Reporter writes, When Payne, 42, and McKay, 41, heard from their reps that Rings was coming to TV, McKay says a shiver ran through us. The duo first met in junior high in Northern Virginia and became friends when they joined the same debate team in high school. Ah, so they are politicians with the gift of the gap. That explains how they ended up at Bad Robot. They moved to Los Angeles and spent years toiling in the screenwriting game without a big win. Their previous gig was at Bad Robot, where they punched up scripts and developed several projects, such as an abandoned Star Trek movie. Longtime watchers of Midnight's Edge will know this to be the very first iteration of the fourth J.J. Abrams Star Trek. The one which was announced the week of Star Trek Beyond opening, and which would see Chris Pines Kirk team up with his dad, Chris Hemsworth, due to some universe-hopping time travel BS. We all dodged a bullet on that not being made. Anyway, they continue. We had reached a point. We'd been writing movies for 10 years that should have gotten made, McKay says. Movies where the director was right, the cast was right, the script was right, and the title was right, and it was a big IP. And it still wasn't happening. I'd be willing to bet that on all of those several movies that for some weird unspecified reasons never happened, the directors went on to direct other movies, the cast went on to star in other movies, and probably in a few cases, the IPs got made in other iterations. The one constant in all of Payne and McKay's previous movies that never happened were Payne and McKay's scripts, so I question just how right those scripts were. Skipping ahead a bit to get to their pitch, The Hollywood Reporter writes, Working together on an apartment floor, they concocted a one-sentence pitch, chronicle the first five minutes of Jackson's The Fellowship of the Ring. The Galadriel narrated prologue that told the story of the Rings of Power, during the course of five seasons. The writers have been described in the media as being like Frodo and Sam, which is cute but doesn't quite fit. For starters, they're often the tallest guys in the room. McKay has an extraordinary level of energy and passion, and when he's in full pitch, he's as persuasive as a Middle-Earth-obsessed Saul Goodman. You find yourself nodding in agreement, suddenly wanting to buy property in Mirkwood. Now, I don't know if this was some intentional subversion or rebellion from the Hollywood Reporter writer tasked with penning this influencer piece. Maybe he'd rather do some actual journalism, I don't know. But he just compared one of the showrunners to one of the greatest con men ever to grace a TV screen, because that's what Saul Goodman was, the con man persona of the otherwise sympathetic Jimmy McGill. Either way, moving on, their pitch seemingly did not go down great. According to The Hollywood Reporter, they were up against people with actual resumes. Trying to convince executives to bank on two guys with zero IMDb credits instead of proven Hollywood hitmakers was no easy task. The people we were up against have resumes that on paper would be more suited to the gig, McKay says. We were the dark horse candidates. 
At one point, Payne and McKay asked mentor and former boss J.J. Abrams to call Amazon to put in a good word, and he didn't. We feel like that moved the needle, says McKay. Then, the Hollywood reporter instantly skips to full-on spin mode. No questions, no explorations of what happened next, just sheer and utter spin and narrative. Yet, the deciding factor was their fleshed-out story and passion for and depth of knowledge of Tolkien's world. Amazon's programming team kept coming back to the same conclusion. The guys with perhaps the least experience were also the best choice. Hearing them bounce back and forth, they had such a deep connection to the material that was there from the beginning, Salki says. This would be the same Jennifer Salki who cancelled Amazon's Conan and fired showrunners Ryan Condal and Miguel Sapochnik, which enabled them to create House of the Dragon for HBO. Just wait till we get around to her. But on their appointment as Lord of the Rings showrunners, McKay says dryly of Amazon, I imagine it was very scary for them. But how could it be if they thought they were the best choice? What the Hollywood reporter was so desperate to skip over, no doubt on Amazon's behest, was that J.J. Abrams putting in a good word for them is the only reason why they were hired. Remember, this was before the rise of Palpatine. The industry still fully bought into the J.J. Abrams hype that he was the next Spielberg. Word had yet to spread that the only ones who actually make any money on bad robot productions are bad robot themselves. So exactly what did J.J. say to Amazon? That they were really good, despite all their movies falling apart in pre-production? That he would be there to help them, ensuring that there were enough mystery boxes? We don't know. But we do know that Daddy J.J. Abrams is why they got the job. Our good friend and former network executive Paul Chato said it best. I would honestly not say this out loud to anyone. And that's exactly right, because it only goes to show that they weren't up for the job. But they say more than that out loudly, namely what they think about the fans. We'll cover that and more in the next video, so make sure you like this one, subscribe, and indicate you want notifications on all videos so you don't miss out on that. For now, let me know your thoughts on these revelations in the comments.